Good Is evening. Thank you so much for coming. Welcome to our final great presenters of 2022 and keep your eyes out for 2023, which starts in January. Um, tonight, we are very excited to have Wayland resident David Hackett Fisher here to talk to us about his latest book, African Founders, How Enslaved People Expanded American Ideals. David Hackett Fisher is a university professor and Warren Professor of History Emeritus at Brandeis University. The recipient of many prizes and awards for his teaching and writing, he's the author of numerous books, including Washington's Crossing, which was awarded the 2005 Pulitzer Prize in History. In 2015, he received the Pritzker Literature Award for Lifetime Achievement in Military Writing. Thank you so much to Professor Fisher for being here tonight. I just have a couple of housekeeping notes. We are recording this session for possible broadcast on our local cable access station, and uh, you'll, you'll be able to watch it on the library's YouTube page as well. Uh, if you are joining us via Zoom, please put your questions into the chat at any time, and I will read them aloud for the, the folks in the room when we get to the Q&A at the end of Professor Fisher's presentation. And so now that I've got that out of the way, we'll welcome Professor David. Pleasure to be here. I'm going to take my mask off. And yeah. Oh, that's funny. Yeah. Thank, you. Yeah. And, uh, thank you all for coming here tonight. It's a pleasure to see so many of you and a pleasure to be in this wonderful library. We it moved in up here in 1962 and the one of the first things we did with our children was head for the library. And uh, we kept coming back uh, through, through the years. It's just an extraordinary institution. I mean, my work takes me into a lot of libraries, but there's something, there's a special spirit to this library. And it's extraordinary the way that it serves this community and the way that the community supports it. It's really, it's really exceptional, I think, to see, see a, the strength of this institution. So now I was invited to talk about my next book, which I, my, or the, my last book, I guess I should call it. Uh, and I, I meant to bring a copy of it. Here it is with this great uh, opus. Uh, my wife tells me that her next husband will have to be illiterate. <laughs> <laughs> this, is the, this is the book. It's uh, African Founders, and it. Uh, came out uh, in, in about the beginning of June. Uh, and uh, it follows another book called Albion's Seed, uh, which is about uh, a different uh, groups of uh, British, um, uh, different British cultures in America. And this uh, follows the different uh, African cultures in America as well. And, uh, I worked mainly with four different uh, British cultures. The African cultures we began to multiply beyond that. And uh, the first rule uh, for the sort of history that I write is to go there. Uh, so my wife and I have been uh, uh, many times to Africa. Uh, uh, we've been to most of the regions. Uh, these are almost all in West Africa, uh, from the bulge of uh, Senegambia uh, south uh, to Angola uh, is where most of uh, most of, of the slaves were brought to to America with a secondary migration from East Africa, but much smaller. Uh, and they brought many, many different African cultures. And it was very interesting to get on the ground and uh, travel with Africans, which is what uh, Judy and I did meeting and talking to people on, uh, about their own, uh, their own culture. And many of them had connections with America one, one sort or another. It was very interesting to, to, to listen and to learn from them uh, about that whole process. So um, I, I, um, uh, I, let, let me just uh, say that um, I, I, these, these books that I do, um, um, uh, look at regional cultures as a rule. That's the way I tend to come at things. Uh, what I try to do is to do a lot of, um, of digging. Um, 
getting onto, on, onto the ground and, and, and looking at the, at the materials that we can find and, and, the, and the, 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 the various uh, written sources, most of all. And then to put all of that together and to try then to uh, tell a story. Uh, I think of what, whatever I'm, I'm writing as basically a form of narrative, one, one way or, 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 or another. And to try to write it, in a way that somebody might actually want to read it, <laughs> which uh, uh, is at the same time that we um, that try to make very clear what the, what the evidence is, where we, where, we, where we found the material and, and what it was that we, uh, that we, uh, that we uh, uh, turned up. So um, the, the, the work that I, I, I did was made possible by the work that many other historians have done before me. There are a lot of people that, who were toiling on all of this, and they have constructed many large databases about Africans in America. Uh, and uh, I, was, I was able to use these things. Many of them are regional in their, in, in, in their orientation, but they cover uh, most of the country. Uh, and they try to get down to the study of individual people as near as they, they can and to document what they find and to put all the evidence in a form that is uh, com computer readable and accessible to anybody who might want to, 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 to make use of it. And all of that has revolutionized the process of, of historical inquiry. Uh, his, history, uh, we think of history as, as being a story in the, the relationship between the, the words, but in its original Greek, it meant inquiry. It meant posing a question and pursuing it. And uh, uh, that, that's, what, that's what I always try to do. Always an open question. Uh, always a question with an open end. Uh, and I think that's that's what I was about. So the first uh, business was to um, uh, ex explore uh, the, the evidence in the form of these vast databases, um, mainly on individual Africans in, in America. Some of it's done by my students, some of it I've done, most of it done by others, much of it done in, um, in for, for local uh, communities, so, uh, 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 towns and cities, states, that sort of thing. And all of this has yielded um, evidence that then we could begin to read for regional patterns of African uh, history in, in America. Uh, and uh, that was the way I started. I was also very interested in where the Africans came from in Africa. Uh, and to spend a lot of time trying to explore the incredible complexity of African uh, societies, cultures, that sort of thing. Very diverse, very different one from another, very conscious of their differences. Uh, and all of that was, uh, was, I think, very relevant, as relevant to America as are the differences amongst Europeans. Who come to America. And I, my, the book that preceded that was my book called Albion Seed, which does the same thing for English speaking uh, of some, uh, immigrants to America. And it was a, a similar story for, for that, all, 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 all that sort of thing. So, um, I, I let, me, so let me approach this in, in a regional way. What I did was I found basically nine regions in America of African cultures. That's what I tended to work with. It could be a little more or less than that. And uh, the patterns, uh, here's, here's what I found. First, the first region was New England. Uh, and here, uh, the, the, the first slaves were not Africans, but American Indians. Uh, and they um, were followed by a few Africans from the West Indies. And then, but not until the early 18th century, uh, did Africans in larger numbers begin to arrive directly from Africa itself, many of them brought by Rhode Island uh, slave traders uh, who uh, really dominated much of that. And they arrived in clusters and they came from particular parts and the one part, in, in, most of all, which is in Western Ghana today, 
And uh, we have been there and uh, these were called uh, Ashanti or, or in, in the 18th century, Asante or fatty slaves. Uh, and they uh, arrived in clusters and they spoke a, 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 a group of languages that were called Aiken, A-K-A-N -A -A uh, languages, uh, which were mostly mutually uh, uh, comprehensible. Uh, and they, they, uh, they also had, along with the languages, they had customs and ethics that centered often much more on the needs and customs of an entire people rather than a, a calculus of individuals, which is more the way that our ethics tend, tend, to, tend, to, tend to be structured. And um, some of them they began to engage the ethics that they made, meant, they meant in America. And most of all, uh, they were very interested in the ethics that they met in New, New England. And there, um, there was, um, they were led by one uh, slave who came from uh, the uh, Santee slave, his name was Coffee Slocum. And they engaged very actively with Puritan ethics and were very, very interested in the interplay of Puritan ethics with their own aped religion. Uh, and it got often tried to combine that in some, in, in some interesting ways. And then Coffee Slocum, as he was called, had a son who was known as, as Paul Coffee. And he, in the 18th century, worked very hard to expand not only the rights of Africans in New England, but the rights of all New Englanders uh, in, uh, in, 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 public, uh, in public life. They persuaded the Massachusetts General Court, that is the, the coffee family, to pass new laws that extended the right to vote to all free male citizens, all free male citizens. That came the impulse of them, came from these, uh, these uh, Aiken slaves in, in America. And they expanded the fundamental rights, not only of Africans in New England, but of the New Englanders themselves in the process of doing that. It was a very large spirited undertaking. And that was just one of these nine other cultures. And let me go through a few of the others. Another one developed in the Hudson Valley. And that was a very different story, but also a very interesting one. This was one where the Europeans were very mixed, but at the beginning, many Dutch were there. And uh, they acquired many slaves, but different slaves because of their trading patterns. They mainly were slaves that came, from, they were called Angolan and Congo slaves that came mostly from what we would uh, think of as Angola today. That's the only country we have not been able to get into. We could get into it, but it's littered with landmines and it wasn't clear that we could get out again. <laughs> uh, so we have, not, we have not done our work yet. In, 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 in Angola, but um, and they um, they entered. It's interesting that these their master their their masters were Dutch merchants, of uh, tough, hard-minded guys who were in pursuit of profits. And the, the the it was interesting to see how the how the Africans worked with them. Uh, they um, began by trying to bargain for what they began to call a condition of half freedom in which they would get certain sorts of, uh, if, uh, if not rights, then, uh, then the grants of, of various privileges and in, 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 and, uh, and in return would, uh, would, uh, would have increasing service and, uh, and the promise of expanding profits for their masters. They were, they were trading with their masters and trading for their own freedom. And they did it in a most remarkable way. These Africans instantly began to see these Dutch merchants were interested in uh, an approach of that sort, much more than any other kind of, 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 of approach. And um, they developed themselves in, as they began to speak of themselves as, as African or even Afro-Dutch. They didn't call themselves a Negro or Black. It was not so, so much a, a racial as an ethnic uh, idea. 
Uh, and they, and, and they, they, it was really quite remarkable seeing how they did that. And that was a story that, uh, that, that became more complex as the population of the Hudson Valley grew uh, more diverse. Uh, but it, it, it changed by becoming even more, uh, more elaborately uh, uh, the, the same in, in, in that way. And again, the, the Dutch always, always were working uh, to, to try to get ahead by bargaining with masters uh, who were interested in, in, in trade. Uh, and they would adapt their strategies to whatever it is that they, it was amazing to see how they, 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 they did that. And then in the Delaware Valley, it was yet another story. This was a tale of, of uh, there were people talked to the Jerseys in the 18th century. East Jersey was one story, West Jersey was another. West Jersey along the Delaware River was one part of this. And then Pennsylvania uh, was, the, was the other. And here, um, the uh, African slaves began to see possibilities in working with Quaker reform traditions. And they entered into, the Quakers were very quick to, 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 uh, to, to get slaves uh, and um, very slow uh, to turn against slavery. Uh, but uh, but uh, they, they began to work together, these, uh, these uh, Quakers and, and uh, Africans, uh, expanding rights of free Blacks by a process of reform by African Americans and Quakers working together within the culture of the Delaware Valley. A very different story from the from New Jersey and from and, 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 and from New, and New York and from New England. And then we get to the Chesapeake colonies where I come from, Maryland and Virginia. And here was the largest of all the African populations in early America, much the largest, as Virginia was much the largest state. Uh, and Africans there uh, sought, um, they also ran into an exceptionally strong pattern of leadership amongst the Virginians and Marylanders. It was highly articulated, uh, this uh, contributing uh, four of our first five presidents of the United States all came out of this culture with an extraordinary tradition of leadership. Uh, there, that was something I think quite special. And the Africans saw an opportunity to try to build a kind of African uh, Chesapeake leadership pattern that was parallel to the leadership that they observed uh, amongst their masters. Uh, and uh, the, who were the people who did, who did this? Uh, these were, uh, there was, there was a, a slave who took the name of Madison Washington. Uh, and he uh, became a, a, a leader in the spirit of Madison and, and Washington. And along with uh, him was, uh, uh, was, was Henry uh, Brown, who was most renowned for having uh, he escaped from slavery by putting himself into a box and arranged to mail himself to Philadelphia. <laughs> and uh, it was a very rough passage. He was, I think, spent most of the passage traveling in a wagon upside down, but somehow miraculously survived and emerged and took the name of Henry Box Brown. <laughs> and Henry Box Brown and his box began to travel throughout the country and uh, awakened a spirit wherever they went. And it was a spirit of resistance, a spirit of ambition, a spirit of striving, most of all. Uh, and we can see that growing uh, among this in this African a population in a very uh, interesting, uh, in, 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 in interesting way. In the more uh, elitist population of Maryland and Virginia, the Africans tried to do something else. They tried to expand and to enlarge models of African American leadership. And um, uh, among them were, uh, 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 one of the, the two leaders were Frederick Douglass. Another was Harriet Tubman in Maryland, who became one of the most interesting of the, of the slave leaders who, amongst women who did to the leader. And Dangerfield Dooley was another one. And these were African-American leaders who made themselves very respected by Anglo-American leaders, copying, but changing the, the, the methods of leadership that Washington 
Jefferson, Madison, Monroe had, had, had used. And uh, in that process, they also greatly enlarged the, the, the purposes and the principles and, and, the, and the processes of American leadership itself. And so in all of these cases, they were actually changing America even as they adapted uh, its culture to the promotion of their own rights and possibilities. Then in coastal Carolina and Georgia, Africans were in greater numbers, but they were up against a much more repressive regime. Uh, and what they did <laughs> was to invent the incredible creativity of cultures, the one was the Gullah culture in particular, and Gullah is thought to be a, a, a corruption of Angola. And, it, it, and the, the counterpart in Georgia, in coastal Georgia, was called Geechee, a Geechee culture. And Geechee and Gullah culture began to flourish in coastal Carolina. And um, what they did was to, uh, they, they brought in the creativity of this leadership. Uh, and I think in that process, they enriched America itself. An example in our own time was one of the, was a, a female leader who was raised in this tradition. It was Michelle Obama. And she was a Gullah who carried this culture into the White House with very creative results that continues to reverberate in our own time. And then in Louisiana, Africans met a very diverse culture. Many different European cultures met there without mixing of English, um, Scottish, French, Spanish, all together in Louisiana. And uh, also a rich creativity of uh, of African cultures and African thought. And what they did was to begin to draw the Africans, maybe even more than the uh, Europeans, to draw on uh, this diversity of cultures in, uh, uh, in, in, in the creativity of, of Afro um, uh, languages, Afro music, Afro spirit, Afro soul. This in Louisiana was, the, was, was incredibly creative in the music that it produced, in the languages that it produced, and in the religions that it produced. And all of that came from the, from the mix and the creativity of many different African cultures with many different European cultures, all compounding on itself. And the Africans were very actively engaged in increasing the diversity of this mix and putting it to work. It's really quite extraordinary to see that. that, that what I'm doing in my book is to add lots of uh, examples of all of this in, in, uh, in, in detail. But through it all, the, the, what they were doing also was expanding, greatly enlarging the idea of a free or what we in the 20th century call an open society. And the uh, W.E.B. Du Bois said that few people I'm quoting from him. Well, few people worship freedom with half such a questioning faith as did American Negroes for two centuries. Now it's three and going on four. And it gets more, uh, more creative as we go. So I'm going to stop at that point and then invite thoughts and questions and we're happy to follow them wherever they might delete us. So wherever you want to take, it, please. But to take, take your mask off if you want to and shout it out so we can hear you. Were the Africans from different, in different parts of the United States, what was to become the United States from different parts of Africa? Yeah. So were they one culture in different places? Or were there several African cultures in the same place? Well, it was a combination of those two, but there were predominant African cultures everywhere. And the predominance was never twice the same. And the words that attach to these cultures give us a clue to what the dominance was. And so that the Gullah culture of the Carolinas, Georgia, is, comes from Angola. 
and, 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 and we can see that working out. In, and it worked out, it was very complex because there was there were so many different African cultures, so many different European cultures. And it was that, that a, a, a huge uh, a complexity in detail that way, which greatly increased the creativity of it all. So that if we look at the history of music in New Orleans, we can see how incredibly uh, uh, creative all of this was in what it, what it did to uh, the music, not only of Louisiana, but of the world. Uh, and that's a story that was repeated many times over in, 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 in other ways. In, 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 in almost any form of expression, uh, we can find similar stories that way. And I, I try to tell that story to, to celebrate it without in any degree diminishing the horror of slavery or the brutality of the system. It was always very brutal. Uh, and yet the creativity of it survived that brutality. Uh, and it was extraordinary to me to see the spirit of this of the people in, in that system, um, even in the midst of the of, of, of the of the treatment that they suffered through. Uh, I don't want to I don't want to deny the horror of slavery. I try to bring out the worst of it as I go telling these stories, but also to show how people um, uh, kept striving to, to to move beyond that, which I think is a it's a, just a remarkable American American story. So, other questions? Anybody? Yeah, please. I'm interested in the guy Paul Coffey that you mentioned. I'm, I'm, I'm interested. I'm interested in Paul Coffey, who you mentioned at the Paul beginning. Paul Coffey, yes. Uh, it, it's C U F F E E. It's usually spelled okay. sometimes C U F F E. Yeah. I, I, it kind of boggles my mind to think that an enslaved person or even a recently freed person could have affected political change at that time. How did he do that? What, what, tell me more. How, how do we do? Uh, how did, did he manage to change a Massachusetts law? How did he effect change? How would they do that? Yeah. Well, I think they would, they would choose the center on particular purposes. Um, they would pry open the possibility of learning to read, that is to say. And they would start with individual masters. And then they would begin to pry open the possibility of going to school uh, with, a, with, with a school here or there. And so these would be small victories that would then be compounded uh, and combined into larger ones. And also combined with every, every step forward, there would often be a step back uh, so that it would be a very slow and difficult to process. And this was a world of very brutal treatment and sometimes a very violent resistance of, uh, by slaves. But at the same time as some slaves are resisting violently, other people are trying to change their conditions and to even to begin to change the society around them. It's, and increasingly as time went on, that idea of not only changing their conditions, but, but changing America itself became progressively stronger as it did in the 19th century. It, it began to grow into, into the 20th century as, as well. So we, this becomes a source of creativity for the entire country. And there are other stories to tell about other ethnic groups as well going on at the same time. All of it to be in, in the telling of the story to be counterbalanced by the brutality of war <coughs> and by the racism and by a lot of bad things that happened and get, it kept compounding. But what was amazing to me was that the, story, the system kept, kept, kept growing. And we see people struggling through all, through all of that. And how do we know about this? We know because we have, first of all, we have slave narratives that were taken down, a huge number of slave narratives were taken down, first of all, by abolitionists. And of course, their purpose was to promote the abolitionist movement. But they took down uh, 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 narrative interviews with slaves. And then after that, in the 20th century, the New Deal launched a massive program encouraging slaves who were still ex-slaves, who were still alive in the 1930s, uh, to tell their stories. And this was done by, by thousands of slaves who were in their 80s and 90s 
they ex slaves in 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 the in the in the in, 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 in the uh, in, in the the twentieth century, and we get increasingly uh, 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 the large volumes of these of, of, of all of this of, of developing, and in many other forms. So we have in, in increasing amounts of material that comes directly from Africans themselves. That's what we look for. And we, we keep finding more and more of it. The more, the more we search, the more we find. That's, that's what helps. Other, any other questions, please? Um, I'm only part way through the book. Yes. <laughs> but um, I, you talk about different ways they resisted slavery from um, petitioning or violence, slavery in, in different ways. They, uh, 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 slave uh, resistance. Yes, yeah, uh, different forms of resistance. Yes, yes. but one of them was um, creating communities and family. Yes. And I wondered if you could talk about, for example, the um, Negro elections in yes. New England, because I don't think folks know about that. Yes. Well, they had all sorts of ingenious ways <laughs> of, uh, of doing this. They kept they kept inventing new ones and. Uh, in, in in New England on uh, for election day, which was a, a holiday in New England, which was uh, when when the results of the election were really announced, they also uh, conducted uh, African elections as well, in parallel to the elections. So when they were not at first allowed to vote, they had their own votes, uh, and they began to to to, to proceed. In that way, and, and they kept inventing things of, of that sort, often infuriating their masters, uh, and yet pers the, 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 the persisting. Uh, it, 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 it's amazing to to see the, the, the way that they the way they, they did that. What were they voting about? What sorry? What were they voting about? What were the same? What, what were if they had a Negro election? What were they voting? They well, about? first of all, they would vote for for uh, the person who would represent them to the community, uh, and uh, then they would vote as to about what he would say, uh, and then he would say it. <laughs> and this happened routinely every year in the spring in New England. There would be a Negro election day. In with which, which will happen in, in New England states. This was mainly a New England custom. Uh, there were many, many other customs like that. A question As they're trying to influence their slave owners, yeah. were they most affected by taking one slave owner and doing the slave community for that slave owner and changing things? Or did they work across slave owners into a group? More broadly than yeah. that, I think uh, they did it both ways. I think uh, um, uh, much of it was done one one master at a time, often with I think great ingenuity, and uh, uh, I, uh, they, I think that's uh, 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 so it were extraordinary, effective, and nonviolent resistance. Violent resistance was violently suppressed, and so they looked for other ways that were more effective and, and, and less severe in their consequences. And began to use them to, to 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 work at their masters. They also began to be able to um, turn one uh, member of the master class against another, uh, the, observing the the, the the conflicts within the master class, the the the, uh, the party conflicts growing in the in the in the new republic after the revolution, of religious differences and that sort of thing. They began to work in in, in in that way to pry open possibilities for what they were doing. They also divided amongst themselves. There were some who thought they, they could never win equality of condition in America. And what they should do, what they should expire, aspire to, to do would be to return to Africa. There, were, there was a movement of course, some among some of them for just that, 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 that process. And that led to things like Liberia, and others, in which they also thought that then they could work for the reformation and the and the, and the advancement of Africa itself. And some of them worked very hard in that in, 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 in that direction. Uh, others went to Europe, uh, and they some of them thought they would find uh, more possibilities in the Netherlands, uh, most the Dutch in particular, than in other places. So some of them headed in that direction. Uh, others went from one part of America to another, many of them moving north, and that begins to become increasingly a pattern. Uh, and we see that happening. We also see increasingly 
numbers of African American women becoming leaders in all of this. Uh, and I think that adds another, another uh, layer to it uh, uh, as well. And then many take up particular causes. Some of them were religion, and they want to convert and to, to help other Africans to find uh, a, a, a conversion. Others become very interested in, in, in education, and they, they pursue that. So they, others go into business, and some of them flourish that way. It's amazing to see how all of this goes on. And it's a, it's a very diverse story going on in the early Republic and on up into the, to, 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 to the period of the coming of, of, the, of, the, of the Civil War. It's a, a wonderful, a, 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 a extraordinary striving that goes on in, in all of this that, 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 uh, through that, that whole process. So also, there's the very dark side of it which were the race riots, terrible race riots in early America. Uh, very violent uh, they, they were. And there, there, were, there were pulsations of this outbreak of vicious violence. There was also just unbelievably cruelty of some masters against the slaves whom they were unable to control. Uh, and that's the, that's the worst of slave lives to see, the horrors that all of that, that, that went on. Uh, and uh, so they were striving against all of that at the same time. It's amazing to see the spirit with which they persisted in this and see it happen among men and women, young and old. It's really across the, the, the great range of the country and in many different areas of striving, religion, politics, economics, and, and all across uh, the, the, the world. And in, in, in the middle of wars, they would take up arms. Uh, and some of them uh, to seek that way, though that led off into more trouble. Uh, and, uh, to, to, and, and, and I think they tended to seek, they, 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 they couldn't win violent confrontations, although they tended in most cases to seek other, other ways forward, which I think is uh, was more, more productive for them. Thanks. Did free Africans live alongside enslaved Africans in various places, like in New England? They, they, they were. They all had access to each other. The, the slaves were usually in their own quarters, in some sense. So they <coughs> enslaved slaves and uh, lived apart, but they couldn't be kept apart. <coughs> so there was continuous interaction between them. And it was a very porous sort of system, which the bastards were never able to control. And that meant that the resistance spread very rapidly amongst African Americans. Uh, and uh, they, they, they were able to, they, 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 they could work together in, 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 in just in that fashion. And we know that because we have so many of their autobiographies. We have thousands of slave autobiographies that have survived. Most of them, in, in many of them in print, others, uh, uh, written down, many of them were written down, in, uh, recorded in the, as late as the 1930s, they were still being recorded. Uh, and we have hundreds of them, and even thousands all over the country, hundreds of them in the Library of Congress. Uh, and these have been in, in databases that are being used systematically in many ways. And it's, and, and historians are finding, keep finding new ways of tapping into this incredibly rich material, which is far beyond any one historian to, to, to master, which is so, so vast, so, the subject. Huge, fascinating. Other questions, please. When you looked at the various cultures that were brought over from Africa with the slaves, yes. and then you went to Africa to research those roots, how much did you find that those had morphed over the centuries? From how much did I find that? Was, how that, how that, much of? It, that cultural that morphed to change has, has changed in Africa. Yeah, yes, yeah. so I the think there, was a, there, there, there were dynamics on both on, 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 on all sides, and everything was in motion. And so we had to be uh, we could make inferences through time, and, and, and because because of that, it was a, it was a very dynamic process. But uh, 
wherever we met, we, we, wherever we went, we found that people were very willing to, to, to meet and talk. Uh, and there were a lot of people who were recording all of this. I have many friends who have been going to, and, and go to Africa and tape uh, interviews with large numbers of Africans, and, uh, that they're both African Americans and, and uh, uh, Caucasian Americans are all, all, all doing this. And Africans themselves are doing the same, uh, the same sort of thing. So we're getting an enormous database of individual uh, 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 um, uh, uh, memories uh, written down. And that process began in the 19th century. It actually began in the 18th century, in the 17th, but it really accelerated in the late 18th century with the, with the slavery movement. And then once again, uh, as in the abolitionist movement uh, in, before the war, and then afterwards in the late 19th and even into the 20th century. So the stuff has kept on growing uh, through, uh, through, through time. And um, then I, I grew up in the, in the city of Baltimore, which has a very large African-American population. And my father was the superintendent of schools in Baltimore and presided in 1954 over the integration of the schools, which he did in an afternoon. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, it was a revolution, as you can imagine, uh, for, uh, uh, for we, we, we had the lowest uh, level of, uh, of achieved education of any, uh, any city in the United States and took a kind of perverse pride in calling ourselves Baltimoreans. <laughs> but uh, we kept to try. <laughs> and, uh, we were very much a part of all of that, and both Africans and, and, and Europeans striving against, against uh, racism, striving against ignorance, uh, against all of these things, and slowly, uh, maybe not so slowly, uh, making, making headway. It's really exhilarating to, to watch all of that, and to have been a small part of that process in my, in, in, in my youth, uh, observing it uh, close up. It was, it was extraordinary to, 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 to see, so, please. Um, you mentioned that Native Americans were the first slaves in New England. I'm just wondering if you can talk about the interaction between Africans and Native Americans. Yes, and that's a, that's a really interesting story. And uh, there, was a, there was a period when Africans were enslaved by American Indians. And there were stresses of that sort for, for a, a, a while. But very quickly, they discovered they had more to gain by, by a common cause, uh, which they began to, to, make, uh, to make together and, and as, they, as, as they did. I know it's only been a couple of months, but what kind of reactions have you had from the, to the, to the uh, community to your book? Well, not, nobody seems to be complaining about it yet. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so far, the reviews have been positive. And you can find them on, online. Um, and uh, I keep waiting for somebody to drop the other shoe. But uh, so far, we've had no major complaints about it. The, the, the book is reaching a reaching a, 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 a public, not a huge public, but it's doing, it's doing okay. And so- uh, And is the reaction it's a, primarily among white people? Or from, uh, from black and white. No, nobody's making complaints yet, I, but uh, we're in the early stages. So, so <laughs> I'm sure they'll be coming in, in one form, or, one form or, or, or another. And that's the way the subject grows, so yeah. Any other questions? Yes. You spoke earlier about uh, different groups of Africans coming to different parts of this country yes. each with their own cultural religion and so forth. Yes. To what extent do you think those differences uh, persist today? Well, it's uh, hard to say. I think um, in, there are clear differences. There's something very special about the culture of Afro-Louisiana culture, I think, uh, something about uh, the entire web of that culture and about the creativity of that culture. There's so many forms of creativity, music for just for one, that for an example. Uh, and uh, I think it varies from place to place. Uh, we don't see not, not, not so much of that musical creativity in uh, New England African culture. 
uh, that tended to take other forms. Um, but that, what, what, I think there were different ways of interaction in the in, in, in different regions. I think what, what makes America interesting, I think, is its diversity, and its regional and its ethnic and racial diversity all at the same time. And all of that creates many different patterns and possibilities. And that's what we see playing out here and then interacting from one region to another. But there's always been something special in this story about New Orleans, about what happened uh, there. And uh, I'm still scratching my head that way. I think in partly it was that the, the European culture was so mixed. It was Spanish and it was French and it was Anglo-American. And then it was also equally mixed and maybe even more greatly mixed amongst the different African cultures. And then there were the Indian cultures that mixed in with all of that. So the so what happened was a, a boulevard of culture in Louisiana that has been especially uh, um, uh, fertile uh, for, uh, the, 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 what, what, for the creativity of other cultural forms. I think Louisiana, I think it's more extreme. But there's another other special creativities attached to Gullah culture in Georgia and in, in, in low country South Carolina. Also very creative, I think. Uh, and, uh, and there was another kind of creativity in parts of the Chesapeake and Virginia and Maryland uh, as well. And then there's something special that happened in all of these cultures. I think the Africans and the Dutch interacted in very creative ways, but they were peculiar to that to those cultures there, as they were also in, in New England and then in, in the Quaker colony. So, so all of that compounded the story. And it's the it's the both the ethnic and the regional diversity of American life that is, I think, is the source of, of creativity in this culture in America today. And to be and to be cultivated, I think it has tended to become a little bit um, weaker through time. Um, as we have we tend to interact more and maybe the cultures become less distinctive than they were. But uh, nevertheless, it's still it's all still there. And still the creativity keeps 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 perking. And that's what we that's what we turn up when we when we go digging this way. And I love to get my students out digging. And they always come back with something that totally amazed them and everybody else that they found to get it on the ground and said in book. It's just inexhaustible. And it, it, we can still have much to learn from more inquiry. Yeah, please. Hi, I'm a history student at Brandeis. Are you really? Yeah. 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 I was wondering if you had any advice for young historians. Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> keep striving. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be discouraged by your teachers. <laughs> I would think that would be, that's what I would say, first of all. Also, to always try to uh, think of it as happening with a, a kind of triangle. With, between uh, students and teachers and the, and the materials and things that you're studying and to keep prying open the possibilities for creativity on your own terms, working between you and the materials and then with your teachers. And I think they'll often respond in a very positive way uh, that way. And uh, it's, an, it, it, it's an open, it's a, it's a system, it's, a, it's an open system and it keeps opening more. Uh, and you can open it further uh, by by pursuing your own possibilities that way, which is the way to to move forward on in your own inquiries. So that seems to me that you know for history, we think of history as we were that many people thought that history comes from that is related to storytelling. But it's not historia in in in, in, in ancient Greek meant inquiry. Inquiry. It was a discipline of inquiry. And open inquiry is the best comment. It's not much of an inquiry if you think you know the answer before you start. <laughs> and the, and the, the, it's great to, to, to try to pry open that opening process to encourage your students to, to do that and then to see what happens when they put it to work with, the, with, the, with findings that amazed both the student and the teacher together. And that's where it really pays off.
Coach, you mentioned that there's a, um, a large database of recordings, autobiographies of former slaves. Yes. Did they discuss? I, I imagine some yeah. of them. I imagine some of them might have been slaves in Africa before they were transported to yeah, America. Okay. Well, I think so many, many of them, some, I would say, no. some of them had been enslaved in Africa. And so did, did uh, they discuss... others, were, others were not. Uh, it's also, there's another puzzle there. Is, was slavery in Africa at all like slavery in America? And the answer is yes and no. Right. And, uh, and so the historians uh, debate that very, very, very actively. <coughs> But uh, so it's a very, it's a very open and complex process out there. Uh, but uh, the openness of it is, is that open, opening to creativity. And uh, it's wonderful to see what students, how students can create. They now, we now have these databases which are very accessible to students. They're online. Uh, they're more accessible to students who are much more savvy that way than their teachers. Uh, and they can quickly get into this material. Uh, and do amazing things with it. And we can also see new questions emerging with every generation that begins to put these things to, to work. So we're just at the early stages of learning this way, and it's all, all, all compounding. And the best part of it is that the students uh, become our teachers in this process. When they, when they, when, when they are encouraged to, 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 make it, to pursue history as inquiry, on their own terms. And so really extraordinary things we can do. I, to I wanted to ask though, and yeah. and what you researched in those autobiographies, did they discuss the slaves who were former slaves in Africa and then were slaves in the Americas? Did they discuss the differences in their autobiographies? Like, did they do. talk about the juxtaposition? Some, some do. These are the slave and autobiographies that we have are almost all written in, in America. Uh, and uh, some of them um, have, have memories of Africa. Uh, most of them don't. Um, but uh, they often are addressing some of those questions in, 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 different, in different ways. And they're vast. There was a huge gathering of these things during the New Deal. Uh, there have been other gatherings uh, since as, as well. There are enormous databases at the New York Historical Society. The Library of Congress is the biggest ones. Most of this stuff is, as I said, online and very easily accessible to students all over the country, particularly if it's online on the federal government. And it's very easy of access for people. And so it's very easy to get students doing primary research online from, 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 from this, this, these sources. And they keep finding more. And they find more other things as well. <laughs> we have a lot of art by students. And it's well, we, and I encourage my students who are art majors to go to work on that uh, and look at those at, at, at those uh, at those sources. We have the, the uh, various sorts of artifacts and crafts and things that they've created. And all of that presides yet another set of materials for them. We have a lot of, there's another uh, field that has developed between history and, de and demography and population studies. And so a lot of work being done in quantitative inquiries from the census data that we have, uh, both, both uh, federal census from 1790 on, and then there were state censuses as well in many states, which produce a lot of ev evidence that historians are just beginning to tap into in, in a systematic way in, on a broad scale. And all of that's yielding more and more stuff. We, we, we're just, there's, there's, a, 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 a stuff, there's more and more things that, that people can work from. But the, 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 and, and physical artifacts and very material culture is something that many of my students are very interested in. They love to work with that. And so there's, a, a, there's more material that way. People are coming into this from many different directions, both African students and uh, African American students and European American students. So all, all, all doing this together. It's going on all over the country, all over the world. Really. And uh, as I said, my wife and I traveling back and forth to Africa. And not so much, we didn't go so much to the African universities, we went into the African villages. Uh, but the people we met were very interested in talking about this. And we were very interested in listening. And it was, uh, it was fascinating to, 
to, to do that. Other questions? Maybe one more? Yes. No? Well, thank you so much. Thank this you. This is wonderful. Very much.